I think you can exactly say that those scenes are, are, are so intertwined and it would be really fascinating to see if anyone involved in the creation of that film had previously read Radcliffe. I think that would be so fascinating. I would love to know because they're so, like, <laughs> I, I would confidently put money on there being some connection, whether or not they'd read it or whether or not they'd been mm -hmm. exposed to it because they're so incredibly similar. Um, and even down to like the characterization similarities between Adeline and Aurora, between Philip and Theodore, because the important thing about Romance of the Forest is that Theodore is the, Theodore is the good hero. You know, he's the only Radcliffian hero really who's that fully developed because the two prior novels aren't as, as kind of extensive. He's noble. He does things because it's the right thing to do. You know, Philip, the key thing that I always find interesting about Philip that I think makes him a gothic hero rather than a fairy tale hero is that he's going to save Aurora because it's the right thing to do. He hopes that his true love kiss will wake her and that she'll want to marry him. But he's, he's kind of not, it's not, he's not like, I'm going to go save this girl because I want to marry her. He's like, that's a terrible thing. I can't allow this to stand. And the fairies are kind of like, Philip, you are a true, noble, good-hearted hero. So we can The romance you. part of it is kind of secondary to yes. the, I'm a good person and, and I'm going to do good. about Theodore mm -hmm. is that Theodore saves Adeline because he he that's who he is he is the chivalric hero i think it's really fascinating that philip you know the rest of he's the only one that kind of actively goes and saves like snow white's prince kind of does it but like a lot of the princes are quite passive you know eric protects ariel because she's there Belle goes back for beast um you know there's a lot of kind of more ambiguous bit in Sleeping Beauty, it follows that Radcliffian narrative from Romance of the Forest where the hero must go and save the heroine, not because necessarily he's like, I must possess her, but because it's wrong and she's been wronged and it's not her fault that she's been wronged. Her agency has been taken from her. And there's this kind of thing where at the end of Sleeping Beauty, the parents are fighting over it because, because <laughs> they both don't know that the the, the person that their child is in love with is the person that they had already betrayed them to. So the parents are fighting, well, your daughter doesn't deserve my son, well, your son doesn't deserve, and then they come down the stairs. So you have this really great moment of kind of, like what Radcliffe does, where she reestablishes, mm. you know, Radcliffe's... It's reminded, me, it's reminded me of the Italian. Yes. Yeah. Um, very, yeah, very so you have different. that kind of subversive conservatism that Radcliffe does where she mm. re-establishes the yes you have them getting married the family unit is everything's re-established but it's on their turn so you have Philip and Aurora come down the stairs and they're like we've made up our own minds like it doesn't matter if you guys are arguing because we actually are our own people and we've decided we're getting married so it kind of take it kind of subverts the trope of the in a weird way it subverts and reinforces the trope of the arranged marriage um which again i think if you think about the plot of romance of the forest and of the kind of that type of radcliffian gothic it just seems really really closely connected um so i might do a seance and summon walt disney and be like hey <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of questions to you, but right now my most important one is, did you happen to read uh, Anne Radcliffe's Romance of the Forest? So, and, if yeah. not, and if not him, someone involved someone else. in the yeah. creation, writing, production of that film. Yeah. Um, so that is my argument. And I could, you know, I could do this in far more detail because I think a number of the films, particularly Beauty and the Beast and The Little Mermaid, have heavy heavy ties to the gothic but because mm -hmm. this is you know supposed to be a nice coherent case I will leave my argument there and I will stop talking <laughs> about well, the forest. You, you bring up a lot of really solid ele evidence um but I, I mean I think to be honest the you know obviously you have the spooky aesthetic and and the creation the the, the kind of creation of the canon and and the the use of the oral traditions but the one that really sold it for me is just that romance of the forest one because right. it's just just that <laughs> chivalric thing um and the 
the thing with Adeline. So yes, Disney princesses, gothic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Two> for two. <laughs> two. <laughs> um, so that has been my argument. Uh, case closed. It is indeed Disney princesses are indeed gothic. Um, if you have any other, you know, if you have thought of anything that I might have missed or you want to discuss it, you know where to find us on Twitter and you can also sound off in the comments below. But in the meantime, I'm Lauren, this is Mary. Stay safe and stay spooky. Stay safe and stay spooky. <laughs>